webinar is organized by Massachusetts Peace Action, MAPA, and Latin American Solidarity Coalition of Western Massachusetts. MAPA is the largest grassroots peace and justice organization in New England, and it has a mailing list of over 10,000 around New England, as well as it is an important player in bringing different peace and justice groups in New England together. Some of his focus, MAPA's uh, focus work, um, is as diverse as the following. They're focused on nuclear disarmament, Middle East, Latin America, the Caribbean, immigrant rights, fund healthcare, not warfare, climate and peace, racial justice and decolonization, state and federal legislative political advocacy. If you are inclined to it, well, please join MAPA. And, and then we have the Latin America Solidarity Coalition that's also made possible this webinar. And LASC is a group of community activists doing solidarity work for peace and justice in the US and Latin America. Recent solidarity actions by LASC include, include organizing webinars on race relations in Cuba, Honduras, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Venezuela, as well as demonstrating in opposition to the looting of Siggo by the US government and Guaido, as well as demonstrating for an, for an end to the 19 year old US war in Afghanistan and for investing federal funds, not on wars and on militarism, but on public health care, housing, green non-military jobs and canceling students debt. The group meets monthly. And if you are from Western Massachusetts, you are more than welcome to join us. My name is Gloria Caballero. I am a member of the Latin American Solidarity Coalition of Western Massachusetts. And now talking about, you know, relating Cuba and Puerto Rico reminds me of Puerto Rican writer and independentist Lola Rodriguez de Tio, who wrote in 1901, Cuba y Puerto Rico son de un pájaro las dos alas, receiving rosas y balas en un mismo corazón. Cuba and Puerto Rico are of a bird, it's two wings and it receives in the same heart, bullets and roses. All that reminding us of our common colonial past, of our continued struggle for dignity that still informs our special relations between the two countries in our present globalized modern colonial world. So this webinar will help us to deepen our understanding of recent volatile history of Puerto Rico with a continuing recession since 2006 university students uprisings in 2010 and 2017, Hurricane Maria and the recent elections. To talk about these issues as well as the rising of political power of the Puerto Rican community in the United States, we have with us today two distinguished speakers. Manuel Frau Ramos, who is a co-founder and editor of the bilingual newspaper founded in 2004, El Sol Latino. He has taught at the University of Puerto Rico and at UMass Amherst. Manuel Ramos is a trustee also of the Holyoke Public Library. We also have with us Gilberto Diaz. Gilberto Diaz is Puerto Rican and communist. For more than 50 years, Gilberto Diaz has been a social, political, and community activist. He was a member of the pro-independence branch of New York a revolutionary Marxist-Leninist organization, and also a member of the Fraternal Organization of the Puerto Rican Socialist League in 1990. In 1991, Gilberto Diaz co-founded Latinas and Latinos for Social Change in Boston, where he resided for three decades. He was also part of the Ofensiva 92, Offensive 92, a campaign for the excarceration of Puerto Rican political prisoners and prisoners of war. He is currently a co-founder of the group Workers and Students for Social Change. Please join me in welcoming Manuel Frau and Gilberto Diaz. Tonight, each presentation will last 20 minutes to be followed by a session of questions and answers, Q&A, and uh, we'll use a chat to <coughs> see questions. The webinar will, uh, will end no later than 8.20. So without further ado, Please, we'll give the floor to Manuel Frau. Thank you for being here, everyone. Thanks. Buenas noches. Uh, thank you for thank you for the. They are, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I thank the organizer for the invitation, and I hope that we have a quite productive uh, conversation. This presentation is based in a ongoing 
uh, research paper for the newspaper about the what happened in Puerto Rico in the last election as well as the USA presidential election. Beginning uh, politics in Puerto Rico and among Puerto Ricans in the mainland is a very complex issue. It's difficult to understand because within there appears to be a single debate among three different options, pro statehood, commonwealth, and independence. There is a larger number of factors inside, outside Puerto Rico that have a lot of power over the political reality in the island and outside the island. Among those factors, that I want to highlight three of them. The first one is the large number of Puerto Rican living outside the island, the mainland. The continuous circular migration of Puerto Rico between Puerto Rico and the USA and the USA and Puerto Rico, but also among different states from Puerto Rico to Hartford, to Hartford, New York, Pennsylvania, and now Florida. And also the, th the third factor is the multi-generational Puerto Rico living in the mainland. I just want to begin to put some data because that is the part of the, my job. Uh, Puerto Rico is the, is the largest, the second largest Latino group in the USA after the Mexican. There are 5.8 million Puerto Rican living in the states and 3.2 living in the island. A large portion of the Puerto Rican population in the United States is based in the Northeast and Florida. Holyoke, Massachusetts and Buenaventura Lakes, Florida having the highest percentage of Puerto Rican residents in any municipality in the country, in, in, outside Puerto Rico. And that is part, one of the most important facts of, of this presentation, Florida and, and Western Massachusetts. Florida overtook New York City at the state with the largest Puerto Rican population. That was after Maria, hit Puerto Rico in 2017. Florida now have 1.9, no, 1.2 million Puerto Ricans, New York 1.1. Then came Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And now the next group is Puerto Rican in Massachusetts. There is probably 3,000, 41,000 Puerto Rican living in Massachusetts. Most of them between Harf, between Springfield and Holyoke. As I mentioned before, Holyoke has the highest concentration of Puerto Rican outside the island. And in the United States, there is no more Puerto Rican in a a specific area than polio. If I look at the next 12 community with the highest percentage of Puerto Rican president in the USA, polio is the first one, Buenaventura, Florida is the second one, Alasia Park, Florida, the third, followed with Poinciana, Florida, Meadowwood, Florida, Hartford, Springfield, Kissimmee, Florida, Reading, Pennsylvania, Camden, New York, New Jersey, New Britain, Connecticut, and Lancaster, the last one in Pennsylvania. <coughs> now, why I mentioned these three factors, population outside the island, circular migration, intergeneral, uh, Puerto Rican living in the Mainland is that the answer for these questions 
have two parts. The first one is simple. We know a great deal about Puerto Rican political preference, especially with a reference to political status in the island. No, everybody study the Puerto Rican political system between the pro, pro statehood, commonwealth, and, and independence. We know about that. However, the second part is more difficult because and more interesting. When look when we look at Puerto Rican living on the mainland, both Puerto Rican born and mainland born, we have to admit that we know little about their political views. And I base this observation basically in a conversation with the professor of Florida International University, Jorge Duani, who studied Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Cuban. And a series of articles in the Nuevo Dia newspaper and Primera Hora newspaper and some online. If that is the the new reality. And the last presidential election showed that a significant, a significant sector of the Puerto Rican electorate behaved differently than many experts expert expected. As an example of this, is there is an increased support of those political candidates that favor the statehood, that is new. In the past, basically everybody won the independence of the Commonwealth, but in, in the last probably 10 years, then there is increasing number of Puerto Ricans in the mainland defending candidate or supporting candidate that support the state of Puerto Rico. And that is basically noticed in Florida and Texas. Other highlight of this is the high number of Puerto Ricans registered as independent voter, no as a Republican, no as a Democrat, Democratic Party independent. That is also very noticed, a very outstanding in Florida and Texas. And the other that was probably surprising for everybody is the increasing support of Puerto Ricans of the, Demo of the four the Republican agenda, especially Donald Trump in the last election, especially in Florida and Texas and Georgia. But that's one of the points. This phenomenon is very evident outside the old traditional Puerto Rican community of New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Chicago, that ten, tended to vote Democrat. That was a classic one. Puerto Ricans living in Florida and Texas are the best example of this changing political landscape. Now, in the case of Puerto Rico in the island, that was another story different to the mainland. Progressive or left political party in Puerto Rico dealt a surprising blow to the traditional two-party system. The share of the population that support the two traditional parties on the island, Partido Popular Democrático, and Partido Nuevo Progresista, the pro-statehood and the Commonwealth, declined. El Partido Independentista Puerto Ricano, pro-independence, together with two new political Party, Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana y Proyecto Dignidad attracted more support of the population. In addition, Jose Vargas Vidot, an independent candidate, was reelected to a second term with a wide support. When we consider these factors, I believe that except existing academic body of knowledge and expertise about Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican politics is outdated and out of focus. 
we are still analyzing Puerto Rican through a very old lens, and we have not been able to recognize that Boricua are becoming very diverse and pluralistic political force. As a final note, that is quite interesting. When I, there is four Puerto Rican members of the, of the Congress, three and one elected. One, Taren Soto, Florida, representing Central Florida, Puerto Rican community, is in favor of the statehood. The new representative of the Bronx, Richie Torres, that is, re is replacing Jose Serrano, that is a Bronx, New York City, indicate that he op he's open to support the statehood for Puerto Rico, too. And then you have in the other side, Nidia Velasquez, representing also New York City, and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, proposing a bill that resolved the uh, Puerto Rican status through a convention rather that uh, the referendum preferred by proponent of the statehood. That's my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite interesting. Okay, so we, remember, we remind everyone that we will uh, continue with the dialogue, you know, the conversation during our, during our Q and A session. Uh, we wanted to just make, um, you know, a short comment that our initial guest. Um, let me look at my list. Adam no. Gomez. Adam Gomez. Yes, he could not make it tonight. He really certainly apologized. He had an engagement that he could not, you know, uh, not um, attend to. So that's why we appreciate our next. Uh, speaker, Gilberto Diaz, for just stepping in and wanted to share what's <laughs> going on on the island with us. And we really appreciate this last minute, you know, commitment. Thank you so much. And let's um, give the floor to Gilberto. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Manuel Frau Ramon. Thanks. Yes. Saludos a, a todos. I'd like to say hello to all and particularly to Manuel uh, mm -hmm. Frau Ramos uh, and to Joaf and all of you, Gloria and Cole and so on. So anyways, I'm here kind of filling in the space. It wasn't my place to be here, but here I am tonight. Uh, I had a few things written, but I think I'm gonna put them aside because I, I did sort of like a Google Translate just a, few, a little while ago. But uh, I kind of like to respond a little bit about what uh, Manuel mm -hmm. brought up because I think it's necessary. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico, as many of you know, we're a colony of United States. We were invaded in 1898 by the U.S. government. As a result of the uh, Spanish-American War, uh, you know, we, we became a war booty. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the island has been occupied ever since. And since 1898, all the way until uh, 1948, we had military governors, those who ruled the island. Our citizenship today, we talk about Puerto Ricans being in different states, uh, such as New York, Florida, the East Coast. Uh, but that's the result of us being a colony of the United States. And we also know that the United Nations has declared, uh, declared colonialism a crime against humanity. And it wasn't until 2000, uh, the year 2000, the United Nations had decided that colonialism should be abolished and that it's considered a crime against humanity. So when we talk about us being US citizens, the fact is uh, that we are second class citizens. Now, why do I say second class citizens? We're an occupied nation. We have served in every war that the United States has been in since they invaded Puerto Rico, and I'm talking about the First World War, I'm talking about the Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, and so on. And it was forced upon us. We called it in Puerto Rico, el servicio militar obligatorio. This is part of the legacy that we live today in the year 2020 about you know, 
our colonial status. We have the, the, the fundamental problem that we have as Puerto Ricans, it's just not a question of migrating to the United States, living in, in, in whether it's in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, or Florida, that's part of the problem. And I say part of the problem because we as a nation have been forced to migrate as a result, a direct result of colonialism a crime against humanity. Citizenship was imposed upon us against the will of the Puerto Rican people. So naturally, the colonial government, the empire that dominates us has imposed their constitution, their federal and military might. At one point, 17% of the island was occupied by US military bases. And through Puerto Rico, they invaded other Latin American countries, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and so on. So Puerto Rico has played a strategic military role historically against Cuba. We could go on for hours, days, talking about what they've tried to do through Puerto Rico. The Southern Command at one point was here in Puerto Rico. I know the focus of this is the election, and I'd like to sort of, you know, just want to give you a little background as to uh, our history. They created a colonial government and they fragmented and divided the population as what uh, Manuel mentioned before, as he said, uh, the pro Commonwealth, which is the status quo, which is the colonial party, they don't advocate for uh, a change in our status. They like the status quo. Estado libre asociado. Ni somos Estado, ni somos libre, somos subordinados como colonia. Then you have the so-called new progressive party, which has nothing, absolutely nothing of progressive. It is the equivalent of the today Republican Party conservative, right-wing, I'm not gonna say fascist, but I'm sure within time, perhaps that too. Then we have the so-called independence party. Now, generally, traditionally for the last several decades, these three parties have been the ones who have participated in the elections here in Puerto Rico. But something new happened in these past elections in 2020. What took place? I think some tend to jump to conclusions quite a priori, quite rapidly. There have been a twist in, in, the, in the facts, and I find them to be somewhat dangerous. There seems to be a projection that the status quo is being challenged. That depends who defines you know, what is left, what is right, and what is center. And I think what we have seen, particularly in the United States, and it's part of that wave, when the states have a cold, Puerto Rico has pneumonia. So everything is magnified as a result of being a colony. Uh, the federal communications uh, FCC is in the hands of the US government. No TV or radio could do anything without their approval. Even the airport, we don't control migration. So just going back a little bit, these three political parties were challenged as they are in every election. But what is the fundamental problem of us Puerto Ricans? What is that made you, Manuel, as a Puerto Rican? You, Gloria, as Cuban, I understand and me as a Puerto Rican that had to live and migrate to the United States. We have the, as far as, uh, and I wanted to correct, the name of our organization that I belong to, it's called Trabajadores y Estudiantes Comunistas por el Cambio Social. That's Communist Workers and Students for Social Change. 
Uh, and I, I want to, you know, just stress that because- uh, Emphasize the communist part. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think it's important, yes. Okay, and uh, because we got to break with this stigma and the cuckoo, the boogeyman, you know, of Congress. I believe just like everyone else, including, you know, well, I'm not going to say who, many others. But I think that what we saw in this past election is the discontent, the lack of trust, the apathy that exists towards the fundamental problem of our society. And I think the fundamental problem in our society is the question of exploitation. And I think just as the Democratic Party has tried to project itself as the political party that represents the interests of working people and progressive, there is no difference between the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, between Trump and Biden. From, in terms of essence, from a quantitative sense, perhaps to some degree or another, but let's not forget, Biden was the one that chose, uh, that, that helped write the so-called crime bill, bringing it back to Puerto Rico. We had in Puerto Rico, two hurricanes back in 2017, Irma y Maria, and it devastated Puerto Rico. Devastated. Thousands of people died. And there are people still to this day, they have tordos, white canvas, a blue canvas over their house, that still have no roof on their houses. 2020, December. So these are the people that helped rebuild Puerto Rico, to reconstruct Puerto Rico. It wasn't FEMA. It wasn't any of the, it was all of us. We saw the essence, the need. You wouldn't ask your neighbor when you had a palm tree or a post in front of your house, hey, what political party do you believe? You know, we did it as a necessity. So as a result of that, I believe that in 2019, Puerto Ricans decided that enough was enough when we had Ricardo Rosselló as governor and we took to the streets. Almost a third of the population of the Puerto Ricans went to the streets asking him to resign. Our organization, Trabajadores y Estudiantes Comunistas por el Cambio Social, took the stand. Yes, we want him to resign, but it's not a matter of him resigning or not. The problem goes beyond him because they will replace him with someone else just as bad, and trust me, just as bad or worse. So now, the same people who supported him, Pedro Pierluisi, won the gubernatorial election since past November election, from the same political party. But now, you had two rival new parties, Victoria Ciudadana, uh, uh, the Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana, Victory Movement, uh, Citizens Movement. And uh, they, they're projecting to be a so-called leftist sort of organization. And, and I refuse to accept that because it's more of an eclectic political party. Their representative in Congress that was running in these past elections was from the so-called statehood party, the progressive party, the conservative party. And likewise, the independence party was removed, removed the word independence as part of its slogan for this past election. They omitted the word independence. They just focused on immediatism, economic issues that we're facing. Four, out of every 10 able body in Puerto Rico is working. That's, you know, six, 60% of the working able bodies are not working. The unemployment is devastating our economy. But can we resolve this regardless of who wins the election? 
and I posed this question like to Manuel. I remember when I lived in Massachusetts in Boston, Jamaica Plain years ago, before moving to Puerto Rico, 22 years ago, I, I'm not sure if you know the Gaston Institute. Andy Torres was a good friend of mine. Yeah. And uh, there was a wave to ask, as a member of Latino for Social Change back then, they, they, there were some who were advocating for the vote of allowing immigrants who are not legal immigrants to participate in vote. And they wanted to circulate a petition. And I did some research. And what I found, and perhaps you could confirm this, is that we have more politically elected officials today more than ever. Mm -hmm. And back then more than we did in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But the level of poverty remains the same or worse. So our, is, is it the solution to our social economic problems the question of voting, participate, legitimizing a procedure, a process that is literally from its origin co-opted and corrupt and a fraud, such as our colonial you know, condition. I believe that the fundamental problem and issue that we're facing as a colony is exploitation. It is not about Yankee go home, <laughs> <laughs> and come aspiring bourgeois, boricua, creole, and exploit us. Hunger is hunger. I think it is a mistake to allow the right, the conservatives to dictate, to identify what is left, what is center, and what is right. I think that we need to look at the essence of the problem that we face. We cannot abolish racism. And for those who think by voting, for example, for Biden, that it's gonna stop the police killings, well, guess what? Unfortunately, that's not because it's institutionalized. It's part of the nature of a society based on inequality and racism and slavery. And we face that today in Puerto Rico. We will continue regardless of who wins whatever election, whether here in Puerto Rico or in the States. And I'm sorry I took it, I went, above my time, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> With that, I complete. Open the floor to discussion or whatever. Yep. I think, um, Gilberto, that what you said is precisely you know, what this webinar is about. It's about looking at how our colonial past inform our present and how are we able to really grasp you know, the idea that this is a time for decolonizing our minds and you know getting more consciousness for who we are, where we are, and the path that we want to lead. Um, now we're gonna open the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Hilberto. You're welcome. Thank you You're so welcome. much. You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. Manuel is raising his okay, hand. Okay, yeah, yeah. Let me add something to the Hilberto point, uh, presentation. I was not the one who called uh, the new alternative uh, political party that progressive and lefty. Okay, I okay. use it, well, uh, there is two excellent articles. One by Jorge Farinashi Fernos mm -hmm. in The Wire, December 8th, 2020, called How Left Became a Relevant Player in Puerto Rican Electoral Politics. That is one. However, there is another one that is better Puerto Rico 2021, a shift in perspective, a new opposition by Luis Fernando Cos, but basically stating that the left tend to glorify what happened in the Puerto Rican last election and forget that the, the history of one day celebration yeah. And basically, one of the examples that he made was the Vieques struggle for the military bases uh, that after the military left Vieques, basically everybody uh, forget about Vieques. No, that was one of the issues. Also, you mentioned Andres Torres. 
he co-wrote a new book. Oh, new book, okay. About Socialist Puritan Party in the mainland, just published maybe a couple of months ago. I was a member of the Central Committee, a delegate, yeah. I should say. It's published uh, with his wife and, and another person just uh, maybe two or three months ago. But it's about Puerto Rico, Puerto, uh, Socialist Party in the mainland. Not in the Puerto mainland, Rico. yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Victor Marco Antonio uh, from uh, La Catorce, Casa Puerto Rico in New York City. I mean, I know. Okay, yeah, okay. I, uh, oh, no, me. How you doing? <laughs> Um, I think we have some questions here in the chat room. Oh, just can I say one, yes. one thing? I have the article. I don't know if you can see it, but the one that uh, Manuel is uh, referring to, uh, the one that he mentioned about Farinacci. And I've read the article, and I find it to be very disappointing. Very disappointing. And, uh, you know, I won't go through all of it, but it's basically to try to project an image that is not so that the left is winning through mm -hmm. you know, the parliament. And the fact remains that the, most Puerto Ricans who were eligible to vote did not vote in this election. And the governor that won, won with a 34% of those that participated. So we're talking about the percentages so much less. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to make the claim that things are moving to the left is really to mislead the public. And I think it's being done with very astute and for other reasons, opportunistic reasons. So forgive me, Gloria. Okay. That's okay. No, no, no. Good, good. <laughs> it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue, much, yeah. And much needed. Um, we have here on the chat room, John Radliff, and he um, starts his, with a comment and then with a question. He says, the economic destruction of neoliberalism applied to applied to Puerto Rico has destroyed the economy of the island and forced so many to immigrate. The PROMESA Act passed by the United States Congress has imposed a junta of debt holders to rule the economy. Now, this is his question. Has the economic situation led to a growing support for independence? Uh, no, the, I don't no. know, who, who's that to? Uh, guy, yeah. My answer is no. Yeah, and I agree with Manuel, it has not. I believe that it's not. Uh, however, the Puerto Rican Independence Party did this year in these elections become a registered, and it's been decades since they were you know, registered as a party. They won their right to participate mm -hmm. in the, the uh, next coming elections. However, I want to say this question of neoliberalism and the other thing that you mentioned, Gloria, uh, uh, of the comment of uh, El Compañero. Uh, promesa. The, the promesa, promesa Act. The Promesa Act was created by Obama and so much for liberalism. Mm -hmm. Just so you can know, this junta, we call it a junta in Puerto Rico, just like Pinochet had a junta. So we call right. this a junta. Uh, it, it, it's devastating Puerto Rico. It has a greater mandate than the governor elect. I repeat that. La Junta Fiscal has a greater mandate than the governor mm -hmm. elected. So the legislator, the Senate, the governor can overturn the decision of La Junta Fiscal. And when we talk about neoliberalism, we have to see. You know, I think there's some terms that need to be addressed. And uh, I happen to consider neoliberalism neo-fascism. Mm. Fascism is capitalism in crisis. And I think that what we're witnessing is, you know, and to many degrees, even in the US, it's the decline of an empire. And, uh, you know, and that has to be, and when empires or, you know, the economy goes haywire, capitalism, then we, what we see is, is that they're trying to extract capital from where generally before you had social services that were, you know, that you didn't pay for. They privatize it and they try to maximize their profits that particular way. But it's very similar to neo-fascism because then the state becomes the apparatus of the private industry by offering these services and they work in conjunction. 
if we look at Germany, that was the case. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to sort of, uh, you know, we also had la reforma laboral, the, 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 the labor reform act. I call it the bosses reform act. La ley patronal, la reforma patronal, where they eliminated days, weeks of, of, of vacation. That um, if you had a six month, for instance, probation period, now it's increased to nine months, in some places even a year. This is all done to uh, 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 represent the private interest, you know, not, not, not the Puerto Rican workers. Puerto Rican working class is devastated. He may call you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Come you, Zeto. <laughs> We have another question, and it's from Manuel Pintados. His oh. question. He says he would like to know why Pierre Lucy was chosen, by whom, and who supported him. Pierre Lucy is worse than any of the past governors, including Marin Barcelo and Winchell. So, um, why he, he was chosen? Who supported him, and uh, and by whom was he chosen? Gilberto, you are more familiar with the Puerto Rican politics. I'm sorry, perdona? That you are more familiar with the- No, called... no, well, uh, to, to answer that question, I think, you know, we have in Puerto Rico, namely, people generally tend to vote here by, based on tradition, family roots, you know, like if your father was a PNP, or well, your son, you know, your, your grandson and, and so on, more by tradition. But we have El Cucu. Are there of an elite that support Pedro Pierluisi in Puerto Rico? Absolutely. He was the attorney for the Junta. He was the attorney and he resigned just so he could run for governorship. And he was, I don't know if you guys remember, but last year when Ricardo Rosselló uh, was removed from office and he was removed, that was definitely protesting. It wasn't as peaceful as people like to think. People were clubbed, people were gassed, people were, you know, pepper sprayed, arrested, and so on. Uh, uh, he became the governor for like about four days or so because he had claimed that he was entitled to be the governor and uh, just a whole bunch of bureaucratic. But to answer your question, there's an elite here and he represents part of that elite as he did when uh, his brother-in-law, who was the president of La Junta Fiscal, was the uh, the president of La Junta Fiscal. So there is an elite that yep. supports him wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. Let me add that the ex-wife of uh, Peluisi is part of the Carrion family, one of the sure. more powerful families in Puerto Rico, Banco Popular. Banco Popular, yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We have another question and it's from Emily Green. And she says, well, she asks, between statehood and independent country, what do the Puerto Rican people want? And what does the mayor of San Juan want? Do, do you mean uh, the mayor of San Juan, Julin, Carmen Julin? Apparently, the... there's no specification. So if she, if Julin yeah. is the mayor right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So what do people want and what does the mayor want? Uh, statehood and independent between those two, you know, statuses, which one? <laughs> well, for, for, for me, Carmen Julien, political position is an enigma for me. That's, I'm not sure if she is pro Commonwealth or pro independent <laughs> or something between, but <laughs> it's clear it's not pro statehood. Yeah, okay. I, I agree with, with Manuel. I think that he's right. And I think that uh, she overplayed her hand because uh, she was from the status quo party, Partido Popular Democrático. And, uh, but she's, she got the least amount of votes out of all the political candidates. She got the mm -hmm. least, even though she was projected to be among the winners. Mm -hmm. And she was offered in Victoria Ciudadana to get that organization. Uh, but she refused to, and I think her, her, I, I don't want to say her ego, I, you know, uh, but I think her ambition, her political ambition, uh, definitely, uh, she, she was, she didn't play her cards politically correct. And I think there was some talk of probably having her work with the, the Democratic Party in the States. There was a lot of talk, particularly between the conflict that she had with uh, 
uh, uh, with Trump during the hurricane. But let me ask you, part of that other question is the question of uh, uh, what, do what do people want? And, uh, you know, let, let me say this. We, public opinion is swayed through the media, through the academia, and uh, the news and so forth, you know. So all that is controlled by the United States. If you look at the World Admin Act, it comes out every year and it, it talks about Puerto Rican history. I mean, uh, it, you, it, it says history, none. There's no history of Puerto Rico. And, and federal holidays, the 4th of July, the independence of the United States. And it says history, none. And uh, so we have throughout these 122 years been denied our culture, our history, and uh, uh, and that's a fact. Who writes the World Almanac? The CIA. So there's been a deliberate conspiracy to deny Puerto Ricans of our history. So many Puerto Ricans doesn't do do not understand what's at stake in terms of identity. Uh, and, and you know, Manuel uh, mentioned you know that I, I believe there's a subculture of Puerto Ricans in the states, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, that, that don't necessarily, they identify themselves as Puerto Ricans, but mm -hmm. not necessarily understand the culture that we live in. I've, I've been blessed by, I don't know who, but I've been blessed to live both experiences. And, uh, and I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, no, this is very edu educational. Um, we have another question, um, and this time from Leslie Crutchfield. He wants to know, what is the status of the independence forces in Puerto Rico, and uh, if there were a fair election? Oh, that's... Roberto, do you know? Well, I what? think... Well, go ahead, no, go ahead, Manuel. Well, let, let me, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the, the article out by Jorge Farinacci Fernos identified the, the new elected politician as a progressive and lefty. However, they run in this election as a no status candidate. Mm. They are basically the, their political program is based in anti-corruption agenda and no political status. Exactly. Mm. So yeah. no status. Well, no, no status, except, except the independent, uh, the pro-independence candidate that run about uh, independencia, but the other group basically run with an anti-crime, anti-corruption platform. That's right, yeah. And, no, and all Go ahead, no, 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 go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, though, the, the question of, uh, of if there was, a, a, what did they call it, a, a, a democratic election? We can't have such a thing. It's a fantasy. The word democracy, you know, comes from two words. Democratia from Latin and, and kratos, which means people or people. government. And when you look at history, the way though they fused those two words, they did it with conscious intent. And the intention was to mislead the public to think those, it comes from Asian Greek 2,500 years ago. And uh, only men, free men had the right to vote. 4% okay. of the population, no woman, no slaves, no immigrants could vote. So throughout the evolution of this concept of democracy and free elections, they've made us believe that we could change our lives. Mm -hmm. And the best example that we can use is Venezuela, mm -hmm. Bolivia, and others, Chile, you know, where when it doesn't please the interests of the local government or the empire, then they don't recognize the elections. So in Puerto Rico, I don't believe we could ever have, as long as we're a colony, free elections. It's a fallacy. It's a farce. Yes. Thank you. We have more questions, this time from Richard um, Krushnik. And he's asking, why is the pro-statehood portion of mainland Puerto Ricans growing? 
That is a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the answer, but because I, I was very surprised what's happening in Florida when a, a growing group of Puerto Rican came defending the Donald Trump after what happened with Maria Hurricane. The reason, I have no idea. That's my next project. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I'd you. like to try to answer that if I may, Gloria. Yeah. And I don't want to monopolize this, por favor. Manuel, no, no, tiene no. Que tirar la toalla cuando puede. Yeah. Okay. okay, but uh, I believe what's happening is, and it's not only in the state, this is happening here in Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. And I think it's the failure of the so-called left and the center. Traditionally, 30, 40 years ago, the party that was a majority was a Partido Popular Democrático, you know, the status quo, pro-colony. And that was the result, I believe, of Mano a la Obra, the industrialization. People were, you know, the standard of living was a little better, but at what cost? Over 50% of the Puerto Rican population was forced to migrate. Today, we produce what we don't consume and we consume what we don't produce. So there's more dependency. 85% of our food comes from the states. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we're looking at is people are discontent and the new progressive party have been quite effective and they have the money, la mula, you know, to uh, pay for, como se dice, cabilderos. Anyway, they, 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 they can pay for their propaganda and that sort of there isn't a vanguard here in Puerto Rico, you know, as a political organization, it does not exist. And what we've seen is working class people are responding to their needs, but they're responding in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that organizations such as the one that I belong to, given it a class perspective, trying to explain that this is a question of exploitation. It's not a question of, of status. Yes, it is, but in addition to that, it's mm -hmm. also, it's a question of class and we cannot put, one cannot be subordinated to the other. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. So now Priscilla brings Olga. Hello, Priscilla. She wants to know, can you speak to the historical role that private industry has had in influencing the politics, that which is related to tax benefits given to multinationals, in essence, extracting resources with no investment of profits in the island? Manuel. <laughs> so Manuel, can you speak to the historical role that private industry has had influencing? the politics in Puerto Rico? Well, let's begin with the following statement. Basically, the, the issue begins with the Manos a la Obra, at the end of the Manos a la Obra project, especially the, when the new leadership came to power in, with the, the Partido Popular Democrático. Basically, it was a Moscoso, ma, the mastermind of the new economic development of Puerto Rico. That, that's the new wave, not the Luis Muñoz Marine Group, basically move up apart. And the Sanchez Vilella, that was a governor, Moscoso, Pico, they came with a new idea that in order to develop in Puerto Rico, you have to offer some kind of subsidy to the American company. And that was the beginning. And um, basically what that was a mess <laughs> because every company in, in, in the United States established some kind of a branch in Puerto Rico, make the product there and they didn't pay taxes, ni federal, ni local taxes. As soon Dominican Republic Mexico, then China, and Filipina, and Vietnam came with more incentive. The factory left Puerto Rico to another place. But basically, Puerto Rican took part of that in, in that process that basically offered a good deal, and the American accepted us. 
the, 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 the business of, 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 uh, of capitalism, capitalism, that's basic. You, you offer something, a good deal, they take it. You know, one, one of the things, uh, for example, is uh, the pharmaceutical industry. At one point, seven out of every 10 pills most consumed in the United States was coming from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And they've received incentives of not paying taxes, free water, free electricity as part of an incentive, creating a few, you know, thousand jobs or so, give or take. But at what cost? contaminating the waters, yeah. contaminating the air, contaminating the land, and they don't pay taxes. They don't contribute to the infrastructure of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. We saw recently from Bitcoin, the founder of Bitcoin, California, was paying 54% taxes on capital gains. He moved to Puerto Rico, his company, his so-called headquarters, he pays 4%. This is a Naomi's Campbell book, you know, a little promo for Naomi Campbell. But in her book, you know, uh, Island Paradise or something of this sort, uh, you know, he pays 4% of taxes. Of, of, you know, that's incredible. So what we've seen is traditionally that these corporations in the name of creating jobs come to Puerto Rico. The EPA laws, federal laws do not apply. They do what they like, you know, they contaminate our environment, don't contribute to, 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 to any taxes to, to our government. And then we have the so-called fiscal problems that the Puerto Ricans now are forced to pay back. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have La Junta Fiscal. So, you know, it, it's almost like a catch-22 heads or tail. We lose regardless of who you elect, and what we do, it's, it's, it just doesn't make sense. It's a crime against humanity. It's almost, I, I don't want to take it as far as apartheid, yeah. but it's a crime against humanity. Yeah. Let, let me add that before the pharmaceutical was the petrochemical industry. Right. And basically we import the, the dirty oil from Venezuela to Puerto Rico. And then, That's right move the product to the American market. But we, basically Puerto Rico, basically process the dirty oil. You refine the oil? Well, uh, no, no, Florida, no Texas, no. Puerto Rico was the, yeah. the recycle yeah. Yeah. of the dirty of the, Venezuela, uh, basically the most cheapest uh, petroleum in, in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have more questions, okay? So what is, uh, Nesby wants to know, in general, what is Puerto Rico's left or politics in general to the leftist forces in the Caribbean? Can you repeat that? Can yeah, the question that? says, what's the relationship? I don't know. You see, it, it says, in general, what is Puerto Rico's left or politics in general to the leftist forces in the Caribbean? That sounds what? like a tricky question, but that yeah. is <laughs> in, in one way, there is a sector of the Puerto Rican independence that is, is very close to Cuba. That's mm -hmm. one part. The other is more oriented to the, the European Social Democratic Party and there is a group, a new wave of dependentista that basically, I'm not sure what is the, the inclination, but it's not a Cuba, it's not necessary Europe, especially Germany or French or Gilberto. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we are uh, at least, uh, with, with other Caribbean, we, we, we believe in international. We think just as you, we have uh, globalization, you know, capitalism goes beyond any borders. We have a slogan called La clase obrera no tiene fronteras. Mm -hmm. uh, the working class has no, no borders. And uh, we believe in that. Uh, 
We do, you know, uh, of course, we're against the blockade, you know, in terms of Cuba, you know, because we find it to be an imperialist aggression. And it's also inhumane, given what our brothers and sisters in Cuba have gone through, you know, uh, in Bloqueo. We find it to be immoral, unjustified. Uh, and, uh, but we, we try to have our doors open with, you know, the international working class, uh, with left and from, you know, other parts like Venezuela and other, we, we know. And, and, and let me say that in our perspective is a little to the left of the left of the left. Wow, I don't know if that means extra left, ultra left, but no, it's not ultra left. But, you know, it, it's, uh, we believe that we have to, for instance, the Puerto Rican community in, in the States tends to sort of uh, agglutinarse and, and see sort of more, you know, like, and, and their own little cliques. And the Latin American community by nationality, that needs to, you know, I think that we need to mm -hmm. really create a fusion of, of, of integration of, of, of Blacks, Latino. You know, when, we, when, I, when I was a member of Latino for Social Change in Boston, we had Cuban, Brazilian, Haitian, uh, 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 Venezuelan, all of Latin America, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, uh, that were members of our group. And, uh, and we broke with that. And I think that helped bring the political prisoners, the Puerto Rican political prisoners home as a result of that international solidarity. Mm -hmm. Good. Let me add something to the, to the Gilberto point of view. When I talk about left or progressive uh, agenda politician, I made the difference that it's a big difference to be a progressive or lefty in United States and Latin America. They are two different animals. <laughs> Trust me. Definitely, I agree. Yeah. Well, um, Joa had a question and, uh, and then he asked, can Puerto Ricans in the US vote in an uh, in uh, an election on the island, but then Manuel Pintado is answering: If you vote in the United States, you cannot vote for Puerto Rico um, elections. Um, how does that work, please? Uh -huh. Do you want Manuel? Uh, okay, uh, Puerto Ricans, we could participate in uh, uh, the primaries. So sometimes you may see, for instance, uh, in the Republican uh, primaries or the Democratic primaries, there's a delegation of Puerto Rico and it's comical. It's very comical, <laughs> you know, because, wow, you know, it's almost like we're participating in, 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 in this election, which is a fraud to begin with, even though, but Puerto Ricans cannot vote for the president in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we could wow. serve U.S. military forces. We could fight for the so-called freedom of, of the United States. We could give our blood, as you know, Puerto Rican has. Uh, so it's a hypocrisy. But Puerto Ricans in the states could vote for the president. And if, let's say, they've moved, they want an absentee vote because they're thinking of coming back, they could do that with Puerto Rico as well. Okay. We're U.S. citizens. We have the same right to basically with the exception of being on the island voting for the president of the United States. And we have a representative in Congress who has voice, but no vote. They're mm -hmm. the so-called representative of the Puerto Rican government. Mm -hmm. But with no vote, what sense is that? Yeah. So we, we have a comment from Manuel Pintado. He says, Yulin is happy with Estado Libre Asociado. She said this when she came to Holyoke. No, you asked. So are we the Puerto Rican diaspora in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, going to support the Junta de Mujeres? I call them the new macheteras. Wow. I don't know, man. I think I'm not a machetero, but I believe, you know, I share similar views, but I say this. Carmen Julie does not represent the left of Puerto Rico, ni los macheteros, ni la machetera. And uh, she's for uh, colonialism. Her party is for colonialism. And if she's for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, that means that she's in favor of this present status, which is colonialism. We are controlled economically, politically, and militarily. Mm. And it's a crime against humanity. Okay, so we have um, 
Let me see. I'm going to go through the questions first, and then we, we all can read the comments. Um, we have Mary. Well, she has a question. Following up on Richard Kay's question, would there be advantages to mainland Puerto Ricans if the island were a state? What would be the advantages of people who live here in the, state, in the United States with, if Puerto Rico becomes a state? Would there be any advantage? No, I don't see any difference. I don't see any difference. Nothing the would change. No. Well, I, I, I see it. Well, one thing, our taxes are going to go up. Oh. Property taxes. Uh, you know, and we're going to be basically foreigners in our own island. You know, but I'll say this as a communist. Uh, the, the class struggle continues, whether we're independent, whether we're a state, or we're a colony. So it won't change my perspective. I'm against exploitation. I'm against racism. And colonialism is the highest manifestation of racism. Mm. OK. <laughs> good, good. We have another question from Nesby. Um, okay, since elections are not a reality, what needs to happen in Puerto Rico to bring about a possibility of an, of an independent Puerto Rico? All yours, Manuel. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to have a new political movement, very clear of the objective and the means. Uh, don't compromise with any less. Mm -hmm. Because if you try to get elected saying that the status is not part of the platform, you're beginning to sell out your, your own agenda. Because once you are in elected, you are going to be, you want to be elected again and again. And basically it's repeating the same topic. The status is not in, in, in it's, a, it's not an issue. Okay. Um, and in fact, I, I, I interviewed Oscar Lopez, Oscar Lopez when he came to Holyoke. And I asked the, the following question, why you became part of the armed struggle? And basically, he saw the Vietnam War as an example of a way to liberate Puerto Rico. But at the end, he said, you know, we, that was a failure. Mm -hmm. Not everybody want to, to have a rifle in their arm and go to get the independence. And that was a part of the problem with the Chicago group. Yeah. Uh, we still don't know where if it's um, through another revolution or diplomacy well, or changing or talking. It's it's hard to. <laughs> what, what, what was the question again? Uh, mm -hmm. if, if, if what I'm needs ready. to happen? Okay. Yeah, well, okay. Well, Since well, elections are not a reality in Puerto Rico, yeah. what needs to happen in Puerto Rico to bring about a possibility? of an independent Puerto Rico. And this is a question posed by Nesby Crestfield. He wants to oh. know what needs to happen. Yeah, I, you know, the group I belong to, it's a relatively new group. We've only been around like for about a year, year and a half or so. Uh, I, I think as Juan Antonio Correger, Poeta Nacional, and the General Secretary of the Puerto Rican Socialist League, good friend of Fidel and, and Che, uh, uh, he said, you know, Tenemos que luchar, luchar, y luchar. And I think that the only way that uh, we can bring about a social change 
uh, it's by having a conscious, a collective conscious, and educated. You know, it's not the same thing of you eating a fish than knowing how to fish. And I think that's what we need to do. I think we saw through Maria and Irma how la clase trabajadora, the Puerto Rican working class, lift itself up out of the ruins of a devastation hurricane, too, one after the other. And we did that without, you know, literally, and I can tell you this because I participate in, in, in taking los suministros, you know, uh, aid to different poor communities, communities that liberated some of the land that FEMA would not dare to go into. They didn't get any federal assistance. And we got, by the way, from Massachusetts, our brothers and sisters, African-American, send us you know, supply to help feed these families. And I think that international solidarity spirit is what we need. Mm -hmm. This is not just the struggle of Puerto Rico. The port struggle of Puerto Rico is the struggle of, of, of the rest of Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, and the world. We have a concentration of wealth in the hands of a few individuals at the expense of us, the many. So I think, you know, we need to educate ourselves. We need to share what we know with others. And our struggle is a very dignified struggle. And we need to, you know, make, share this wealth of knowledge that we have acquired throughout, you know, decades and, and put it to the, you know, in the hands of, of the many. Share it. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to humanity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a lone one, right? This is Steven Fernandez. Just a reminder, the um, webinar is supposed to end at 8.20. We have four more minutes. So mm -hmm. Steven Fernandez is asking, in response to the crisis in neoliberal capitalism, I am seeing some progressives in the United States embracing a top-down capitalist-driven Keynesian capitalism. I'm seeing this in particular with respect to the climate crisis where even Noam Chomsky has stated, quote, I would like to overcome capitalism, but it's not in the relevant time scale. Um, global warming basically has to be taken care of within the framework of existing institutions, modifying them as necessary, and, end of quote. And he took this from Vox. So Stephen is wondering if you could comment on the implications regarding sustainable energy in Puerto Rico, where after hurricane, Elon Musk got millions to solarize Puerto Rico rather than local groups working on sustainable energy initiatives. And who is that the rest director is, to wrote it? Um, it's to the panelists. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. He would like to, you know. Well, no, let, let me ask something. Uh, comment. Casa, yeah, Casa Pueblo was a, has a project of a solar partner in the middle of nowhere in the mountain. And that was a quite ex a success project. However, he came to a conference at UMass and one of the most important critique from him was against the union labor of the, because the most, in addition to the governor, that and the uh, electric power company, that some union movement thought that Casa Pueblo was doing the job of, of the labor that they represent. And there was a, a, a quite interesting discussion about the the how re, how the labor movement stopped basically the progress of the Casa Pueblo for for a short time of Alberto. No, I, I think you know by the way if it's the same Steve Fernandez, saludo Steve Fernandez because uh, he used to be in Latinos for social change if it's the same one. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, uh, 
We yes, have please. A, Steve oh, Fernandez. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. My brother, comrade, Steve Fernandez. And uh, there's a struggle going on now here in Puerto Rico against La Ceniza, carbon uh, 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 ashes, and they're very toxic. And uh, they've uh, basically, what they've done is try to uh, use the ashes and, and, and apply them to the construction industry, overlooking the health hazards that this has. Obviously they do this for two reasons. One is, they don't know where to dump it. They were dumping it in Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo people were getting cancer left and right. So they decided to bring it back and they started burying it here in Puerto Rico in Umacao and other parts of the island. And uh, again, we see how private industry has a greater mandate than the health and the well being of the Puerto Rican people. They've contaminated the land, the water, and the air. Literally, Houses that are, are close to where they have they 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 pulverize and they you know they use uh, the, the the processes. Houses turn gray. The the level of cancer is outstanding. It's it, it's it's ridiculous. So there is a struggle in terms of the environment. One example I must tell you, and you guys are probably familiar with Costco. Costco a few years ago tried to implement you know have solar energy. And they refuse to allow they, the, to give them the permit. I'm not quite sure what it is now, but I believe it's still the same. To allow them to have solar panels, it's because there's certain economic interests involved mm -hmm. at the expense of us. We have an island that, out of the 365 days, we had a good, you know, minimally, I would say, 270 days of, of sunshine, if not more. Why don't we have <laughs> solar panels? You know, it's a crime. You know, we shouldn't be dependent upon, you know, crude oil or anything of the sort. It does not make any sense. But special interest groups, of course, have the power, economic power, and the legislation and the politics and so on. Mm -hmm. On that same line, uh, Roberta Keegan wants to know um, the impact of the U.S. military bases on the economy and the environment. Wow. Well, go ahead, Manuel. <laughs> Basically, the, the last one big military base was uh, in Ceiba, uh, uh, and it's close. Uh, there is a, uh, maybe Buchanan is the only that left. Yeah, no, they, they, and what's they, the they, impact of the military bases on the economy and the environment? The U.S. military oh, base. Oh, well, no. Uh, when the U.S. When the U.S. Navy left Vieques, basically left a environmental, environmental mess in, in, in basically three quarters of the island of Vieques. That was a fact. And in, in fact, there is a group from Boston, UMass Boston, doing research about cancer okay. among the Vieques population right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right because they have one of the highest uh, percent of uh, cancer incident in, in Puerto Rico. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the military, let me say this, I, I think it's important because there's also uh, a tendency of, uh, of uh, seeing that the U.S. Armed Forces left Vieques. They stopped the bombing, but the land still remains in the federal hands the mm -hmm. Department of the Interior. So we stopped the bombings, but U.S. Armed Forces still, you know, they could activate that whenever they please to do so. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's another, you know, misleading, you know, that, the, oh, we won Vieques and, you know, that uh, there's no more bombings. Was that truly the objective, stopping the bombings? What about the thousands of Puerto Ricans that lived on Vieques? that were forced to migrate to St. Croix and other islands as a result of the bombing in Vieques and Culebras. Culebras is more of a tourist, but Vieques in particular, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they've been very deceitful and they have not cleaned the bomb. Mm -hmm. the, the, the island is still contaminated as mm -hmm. we speak. Alberto, there's a question directly to you from uh -oh. Priscilla Ren Ortiz. 
And she says, Gilberto, living on the island, what do you realistically see taking place over the next 10 years with respect to the status, realistically? Realistically, <laughs> no, and I'll be realistic. Listen, <laughs> I, I can't be, you know, uh, I'll be very realistic, Priscilla. Thank you for the question, Priscilla. Listen, I believe in social justice. I believe that even if I don't get to live to see the fruits, of what I think that every human being should do. I think that it's, 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 it's our moral and ethical obligation to fight for social justice, to fight against injustice. So I believe that what we're witnessing at this particular moment, whether I see it or not, but I think that at some point, the working class, Puerto Rican working class is gonna rise and, and, and really see, as the US empire declines in the states, the crisis is only gonna get worse, not better, regardless of it's Trump or Biden or whoever it is. You know, we're looking at a declining empire. We have economic blocks in the world. You have the Asian Pacific, you have the uh, European Union, you have the, the North American you know, trade agreement. And we're gonna see those conflicts intensify. And what we're witnessing is that the United States is being challenged economically. And as a result of that, I think that, you know, many corporations as they've done, particularly in the 2000s in the last 20 years have been in search of cheap labor and natural, natural uh, resources. And Puerto Rico doesn't necessarily offer that anymore. And with the high technology, even military bases as it did before with the high technology, that's even decreasing. They could, you know, do other things, create their own islands and that sort of thing, as the Chinese is doing in the Pacific. So I think that realistically, I hope that there's, as Che Guevara used to say, receptive ears to listen to our voices of we are, como dicen aquí en Puerto Rico, we are the many, somos la mayoría, you know, and uh, we need to, you know literally gather together, you know, and create solidarity organizations, revolutionary organizations. And I'll take it a step further, you might not, but communists, uh, you know, you know, we need to build, you know, a, a, a true, really true uh, revolutionary movement. You know, it's not a question of displacing one exploiter for another. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It all equates the same. Yeah. And I think that's what John Radcliffe is commenting here. He's saying, wasn't the uprising that overthrew Rosselló a first step, a sign of what the people can do to force change once it becomes mm -hmm. more conscious and goes through experience and develops develops a leadership? That's what he, you know, Gloria, is commenting. You, you, you touch on the touch, and the question is excellent because I think that's part it's John, John Radcliffe's, you know, I'm just uh, <laughs> voicing okay. Yeah, okay. Well, what let, he's saying. Well, let me say this, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so adamant to try to expose what some are projecting, such as the article that uh, Manuel mentioned about Parinacci, that there, you know, this is what we witnessed, it was the discontent of the people. We saw people regardless of political party. It wasn't a question of status. It was a question of, of survival, of, of their rights being taken away. And they didn't say, are you pro status quo? Are you pro statehood? Are you pro independence? They said, no, we have to defend our rights. And they, you know, they unified. Mm -hmm. That's an example of what class struggle is. And I think that, you know, this is what we need to do. And I think that there's certain sectors that are claiming that there's a victory in these past elections when the majority of Puerto Ricans who were eligible to vote did not vote. They didn't participate. So where's the victory? Where's the inclination towards the left or, or to the center as Farinacci and others are saying? It doesn't exist, it's a fallacy. And they're doing that for economic reasons to popularize a fallacy. And I'm here to conquer that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. So Gina Rivera, and uh, with this, is, um, the, one more question. Gina Rivera wants to know, if Puerto Rico were to adopt ranked voice voting for its uh, gubernatorial races, 
Do you believe this would make a difference in what party assumes political control? <laughs> yeah, if Puerto Rico were to adopt ranked choice voting for voting, right, for its gubernatorial races, do you believe that this would make a difference in what party assumes political control? Well, it depends how she defines what's ranked voting. How does she define that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is Gina? Yeah. This is a voting reform that's been passed in some places in the United States recently. It was on the ballot in Massachusetts last month, though it did not pass. But it's in effect okay. in Maine and uh, a few other places. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carl. Thanks. It's kind of an automatic runoff where you where the voter ranks their choices their one, choices. two, three, and then they keep on eliminating the the lowest vote the until lowest someone vote. gets a majority. That's the mm -hmm. right. I can tell you, I'll probably be the last one that I ever ran on that <laughs> list. <laughs> I might make it to the bathroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to the question. No, I don't all, understand the concept. That's OK. Yeah. yeah. So we've been going for an hour and a half hours, maybe time to wrap up. Yes? Yep. So, Thank you everybody so much for staying, for signing up for this important and, you know, webinar. This is another way of how we um, get conscious as to how our past colonial past still informs our, you know, present in this modern colonial world and how the more we talk about it, the more conscious we are and the more we try to decolonize our minds, our bodies, and the spaces and all the forces that try to impose upon our bodies, you know, all the legacies of the past. Thank you so much. Stay well, stay safe. And thank you to Manuel Frau Ramos and Gilberto Diaz for sharing, you know, your ideas, your experiences uh, with us. We've learned a great deal. It's been a lot of fun too. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you. For, 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 thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Have thank a great you all. Night, thank you for everyone. the invitation. And Hopefully we can do this again. Oh, yeah, I would love to. Thank you a so much. Take yeah. care. Ciao. <laughs> bye -bye. Ciao.